Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate each and every one of you tuning us on in for another edition of Science Bob and Friends tonight. Before we bring in Dr. Joseph Burks, I do want to say that Science Bob is not going to be joining us tonight. He has a family emergency that he had to fly out of town for this afternoon. He apologizes to all of our listeners, but Dr. Joseph Burks is here, and you guys are in for a great, great night. We'll bring on Dr. Burks here momentarily. Let's give a shout out to everybody in our chat room. So far tonight, we have race fan in the gold medal position. Apparently, that's where he belongs. The gorgeous Jenny Metz taking home the silver, Nicola with the bronze, and Nicola, thank you so much for kicking off the super chat tonight. Really do appreciate your love and support of Spaced Out Radio. Thank you very much. Black Dragon, how you doing? Good to have you here. The gorgeous Cosmic Floor, always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Hi, SJ, Fidgety Aura, good to see you guys. Thank you so much. Ozzy Ange is here, everyone. The lovely Ozzy Ange. She'll be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind. To the left of the studio. Chad Smith is here. The Chad Smith. There he is. Everyone, uh, just just eat, take it all in and just let it sink in. Chad Smith, everyone. Sonny, good to have you here. Thank you for coming on in. Appreciate you. So we scroll on down. There's John Swan, everybody. Sultry Susie is here. She'll be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio. So you have Ange on the left, Susie on the right. Neither like eye contact. So if you want a good autograph, don't make eye contact. That's all they ask. Chris Holm, welcome to SOR Chat. Uh, Wes, good to see you. Double Tim, thanks for coming on in. Jazz, nice to have you here as we continue on scrolling on down. And we have next in the list of people in the chat room so far. Uh, well, there's Chad Smith with an awesome super chat. Thank you so much, Chad. Really appreciate that, man. Thank you. Um, Mama Susan's here. There she is. Give us a wave, Mama Susan. And uh, Nucker, good to have you here from the beautiful state of Oregon. Luscious Jewels, awesome cat chaser. Nice to have you here. Tessa, thank you from Australia for a wonderful super chat. Really do appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support of Spaced Out Radio. Uh, I don't know what else to say. I really don't. Um, thank you, though. Uh, where are we? JR, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Troy SR71, nice to have you back, buddy. Stephen Edmond, always a pleasure. Steve Stockton from KPNL Radio, 5900 buck. Good to see you guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and as we continue on down the chat room here, Peppa H at Open Mind and Clarity. Good to see you guys. Millennium, always a pleasure to have you here, guy. Good to see you. The gorgeous Science Melinda Fapster, nice to have you both here. As we continue on, Ozzy, Ozzy, oi, oi to you, my friend. Always a good, solid oi, oi to you. The gorgeous Laura Stevens, Fiddleback, and Vin Manor here. There's Noble Patrick. Good to have you back, my friend. As we continue on, scrolling on down, Mennonite Abe, good to see you. The gorgeous Block Sheik, how are you? Uncle Dale and his power stash are here. If you're in Austin, Texas, find Uncle Dale, rub his power stash for three weeks of good luck. Yola Tango, Super Gary, how are you guys doing? Thank you for joining us. Uh, Vanner Smith, nice to have you here. The gorgeous Jenny, always a pleasure. Spooky Morales, good to have you here. Richard Elmore, thank you for joining us. As we Dirt Road, how are you? And I said Richard Elmore already. We only got about 30 seconds here. Lone Wanderer, good to see you. Double Tim, thank you for that amazing super chat. Really do appreciate that, buddy. And uh, we're going to get going here in about 29 seconds. So uh, thank you so much for everybody being here. Magnus, good to see you. Apollo 11, thanks for coming on in. Stetson John, nice to have you here. The gorgeous Avi May and Noble Patrick, thank you so much for that super chat. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. We're going to get going in 10 seconds. Remember, hit that subscribe button if you are new. And Fabster, thank you for the super chat as well. Good to see you, buddy. Here we go. Horns up.
From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. All you got to do is go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio and on Instagram at spaced out radio show. Our website is spaced out radio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Now, the second week of each month, we do a little ditty around here called Science Bob and Friends, where we bring in Dr. Bob McGuire to come in and talk about the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the paranormal field. That's the umbrella word we use, paranormal. However, Science Bob had a family emergency this afternoon that he had to head off to Atlanta, Georgia, and could not make it. He passes his condolences to all the Spaced Out Radio listeners who love having him on this show, and he will make it up to all of us. But nonetheless, we have an amazing special guest tonight. Now, I got to meet Dr. Joseph Burks a couple of years ago at UFO Con 2020. Or was it 2019? One of the two. Either way, this man, when when he walks into a room, literally, if you've never met him, when he walks into a room, like everybody crowds around him. They want to they want to talk to him because he is so smart, so educated, so diligent in his work that he literally is someone that is a legend in this field. I know he's going to blush when I say that. He's probably going to reach through the screen and absolutely smack me on the side of the head. But that's okay. I'm going to remind him he's a pacifist. So he can't do that. But nonetheless, he has been at the forefront of every type of ET contact and the science behind it. It's not just about the woo. It's about answers to those questions as to what is happening with people around the world when it comes to extraterrestrials, consciousness, CE5, aliens, UFOs, and everything in between. Dr. Joseph Burks, it is always a pleasure to be able to have the opportunity to speak with you. You are a mentor and a friend, and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming back on Spaced Out Radio. Thanks so much for having me on. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Dr. Burks, now you were somebody, you went to university in the 60s during a very uh, high tense uh, time in the United States. The Vietnam War was going on. You were uh, against the war. And I remember the last time I had you on, you you told us that entire story about how tough it was. But going from an activist where you've lived an activist life your entire time to switching over to the UFO field, how did that happen for you? I'd like to say it was a uh, chance, but in the course of working with uh, countless experiencers, I suspect that um, the intelligence behind the phenomena had me uh, targeted and through, shall we say, uh, suggestive means, consciousness means, got me involved. Not when I was a teenager trying to stop the the Vietnam War and uh, working with civil rights groups. Uh, Not when I was in medical school and finally became a practicing internist. But they waited for me to have a career, a family, and be on very solid footing before uh, I caught the UFO bug. And it was just seemingly by chance that I went to the local public library and picked up a book by uh, Fred and Fra- uh, Ed and Francis Walters, the Gulf Breeze sightings about the events that happened in this uh, Florida panhandle. And all of a sudden, the subject had overwhelming interest for me. And I read one book after another. And uh, finally, about a year later, I went to a UFO meeting. So during the uh, 1980s, when I was a young Dr. Burks, we had an international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war. We were a doctor's group that met with Soviet physicians. And we brought back the message to the people and leaders on both sides of the Iron Curtain that nuclear war was not good for children and other living things. We talked about the medical 
hazards of the nuclear arms race that was consuming vast amounts of resources. And so I was familiar with citizens diplomacy because I had traveled to the Soviet Union. I went to my first UFO meeting and then I saw a tall bearded doctor uh, who was also working in emergency room where I was stationed at that time in the ER down in Southern California. And uh, he said he had a, a method to attract UFOs to secure research sites where limited interactions could take place. So his name was Dr. Stephen Greer, a very controversial figure then and now. But I uh, signed up for the program. I learned the consciousness techniques of his center. And I was off and running. Uh, and for the next five years, I had very intense series of encounters. Um, after five years of working with the center, Dr. Greer and I had went separate ways for political and personal reasons. But I still supported the concept of human-initiated contact. I've coined the term HEIS as a substitute for CE5. We can get into some of the reasons why human-initiated contact event is superior to CE5. Um, it doesn't have the toxic effect of being associated with someone who's so controversial as Dr. Greer. And I continued that work um, making contact with other networks of contact activists and uh, Mission Rama. I worked with them. They had some amazing sightings. People in my team joined with Rama. And we can talk about Captain Joe Vallejo when he uh, was inside a dimensional portal that the Rama group opened near Mount Shasta. So those five years were very exciting. Uh, learned a lot. And one of the things I learned was that the consciousness connection was central to the human non-human relationship. And not only that, but that the intelligence behind the phenomena used illusory mechanisms of contact in order to stage uh, what we call close encounters. Now, and I developed what I call the virtual experience model as a paradigm that explains how these illusory mechanisms are actually employed uh, with uh, non-human intelligence acting on human subjects. So those are the areas that I was most interested in. Of course, the work that we were doing was of interest not only uh, to the contact community, but also to the intelligence services for the executive branch of the U.S. government. We had many encounters, uh, uh, and there was evidence of surveillance of our teams, which we can talk about. And... Uh, in 1998, uh, I should say 1997, I was actually threatened uh, that I had to, it, was, it would be better for my health if I got out of the human initiated contact network. I'm sorry to say that that played a role in my resigning from the network that I helped build. Although several years later, I was able to get back into the game. So those are the high points uh, of my work. And we can get into the specifics, uh, specifics, I should say. Oh, we're, we're, we're going to get into a lot of that tonight. But for you, at what point when you started studying UFOs, did you notice how political it actually was? I would say reading about the uh, MJ-12 documents that were reported on in Above Talk Secret by Timothy Good and the controversy around those documents uh, showed that I was entering into an intensely political arena where very strong opinions were being expressed. And had, sadly to say, a lot of the, there was a lot of fire, but it, a lot of it had to do with just turf, territory, and ego. Uh, and one of the things that I learned in terms of my own consciousness journey was that one has to be aware of the pernicious effects of ego and how it affects not only personal relationships, but also the larger society. So I would say that would be right, right off the top. The third book I read probably was Above Top Secret. Really? And, and as you started to go down this political realm as an activist, now working with trying to figure out the whole UFO phenomena, were you surprised at how deep and how uh, 
curvy the the entire slide was going you know from the government all the way down to the military and all the alphabet agencies in between covering this up i was prepared for that because i was an activist in in social movements that were considered at various times to be subversive and so you know uh, civil rights at one time was a subversive subject because black people were not allowed to sit at the counter at restaurants and the, the local police uh, arrested civil rights workers. Well, I was involved in the civil rights movement. Same thing with the farm workers union. Uh, there were times when farm workers were physically attacked by goons. So I knew that uh, conflict comes about when you challenge power. In the case of the trade union movement, it was the farm workers against the big agri corporations and when it came to civil rights, it was the struggle against Jim Crow segregation. The Vietnam War, a military machine that sadly got us involved in a senseless war that killed 50,000 Americans and two and a half million Indo-Chinese. So when I looked at the UFO situation, I realized that this issue, from my point of view, fundamentally threatened all terrestrial elites. I'm talking about the military because flying saucers can fly circles around the F-14s and 16s, the top guns. So the military had a reason to keep it quiet because they were unable to secure airspace over very sensitive installations like nuclear bases. So that was the military was definitely a big part of the cover-up. But there was also the politicians. Uh, politicians gained their power by promoting nationalism. As Stanton Friedman, the great UFO investigator, sadly is no longer with us, he said, nationalism is the name of the game. And it seemed likely to me that whoever these UFOs were piloted by, they looked down at us as one people and one homeland. And so for politicians, it made sense to keep this quiet because if we knew that there were extraterrestrials, the chances were that over time, people would realize that the national differences that keep us apart, nation against nation, well, those differences pale compared to our differences with what appear to be advanced technologically and also spiritually advanced civilizations. So the politicians saw it in their self-interest to keep this quiet. Uh, then there was the financial aspects. Uh, whatever this fly, whatever is the energy system of UFOs, they're not flying on fossil fuels. And it's been postulated that some kind of free energy, uh, perhaps from the vacuum of space or some kind of controlled fusion, uh, is generating the enormous power required to for these craft to carry out amazing maneuvers. Well, what's the biggest industry on this planet? Oil, petrochemical, coal. So if under conditions of world peace, which is a big if, uh, we could download into our technological culture such technologies, it would end the empire of oil. So from the point of view of certain captains of industry, it might be a good idea to keep this issue quiet. And then there's all the religious aspects in terms of not all religions, because, you know, for example, the Catholic Church has taken a very, but in my opinion, a very progressive view on this subject. They say ET is our brother. Uh, and they, they imagine that they could carry out some kind of missionary work, at least to share their view of the creator with the extraterrestrials. Uh, some uh, groups, fundamentalist groups, whether they be Islamic or Christian fundamentalists, see the so-called ETs, the intelligence behind the phenomena as the devil. And you don't want to dance with the devil. And so that would be a reason why certain fundamentalist groups, and I think uh, Lou Elizondo has talked about the role of certain fundamentalist ideologies in the Pentagon, which was trying to put a lid on his efforts to bring this out into the open. So we see across the board that major power elites would want to keep this issue under wraps. So the politics of UFOs uh, made sense to me as someone who was in a position all my career of trying to decide 
to be on the side of people who did not have power, who wanted to challenge power in order to make a better world. So for you, as you went down this path, at the time when you started with UFOs, had you ever seen one? Had you ever had an experience? Absolutely not. The, the only UFO background that I have is uh, my godfather was interested in science fiction and also UFOs. And when I was a little boy growing up in New York City, he used to tell me about Long John Nebel. I'm sure as a radio person, you know about that the Long John Nebel show. But I was never really interested in UFOs. My friend Van, my godfather, we talked about science fiction. But for me, it was all fiction. I read one book in college, Chariots of the Gods on UFOs, but never read another article. Although I do remember in 1975, James Earl Jones and Estelle Parsons did the uh, UFO incident as a television movie talking about the Betty and, Bar Benny and Barney, Betty and Barney Hill case. But that was it. I didn't um, think about it for another 30 years until, uh, for some strange reason, the subject became fascinating for me. What time uh, did you decide that you wanted to meet up with Dr. Stephen Greer and see what he was trying to represent regarding UFOs? It was 1992. His group, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, was formed in 1990. 1991, the first working group uh, was formed. Um, and um, in uh, August of 1992, our Los Angeles team went into the field. De the Denver group was headed by Sherry Adamack. And it was she and Dr. Greer who formulated the protocols that uh, we employed with amazing success. In fact, during the early years, uh, and this gets into the whole issue of what I call prime contactees, during the early years, Stephen Greer was a veritable UFO magnet. Every time he went out into the field, you can bet your bottom boots that this was going to, that you're going to see a UFO. And the first time I went out in a demonstration of the field work in West Palm Beach, I saw my first UFO. I was pretty excited. A blue-green light came off the Atlantic. There was a cloud cover oh, a couple of hundred feet up. The blue-green light silently flew over about 90 to 100 miles an hour. It was an anomalous nocturnal light. And on the basis of that contact experience, I volunteered, I trained, and I had soon found that I had a dream team of fellow investigators. Uh, the CSETI director came out to California and for um, a, a small, then he was charging like $40 for a workshop and $40 to join CSETI, unlike his ambassador trainings, which people com have complained about, cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, a, a, my team came together and it was, it was just a remarkable group of individuals. We had three physicians, PhD psychologist, a 747 pilot, Captain Joe Vallejo for United, and even a, a, Berg, uh, a, a young man who was the youngest member of the team. Uh, you, you probably know Preston Dennett. He was on yeah. my contact team. He's written over 20 books on the subject. And we had uh, an heiress who sailed the seven seas and knew the sky, the sky like the palm of her hand from navigating on a, on a yacht. This was a very powerful team of investigators. Also, there was a Harvard graduate who had two master's degrees uh, and uh, was a, a screenwriter for Hollywood. So there was a very diverse group, uh, but it was very gratifying that I had the support of two of my colleagues in my medical group. And as soon as we hit the ground, we had sightings and amazing encounters, which I'll, I'll share with you if you like. Yeah, we have three and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. So we do have some time here. Okay. So the, the most um, significant sightings were of these, these lights, orbs that went up and down beyond Rocky Peak. Uh, we were operating in the Santa Susana Pass, uh, which was right near the Department of Energy site. And we had Golden Globes appear 
And then on the ridge line, powerful lights signaled at us. Now, I first thought they might be uh, teenagers. Uh, but when I, we sent scout teams up to this cliff, it was almost impossible to get there. And I felt there was a consciousness link between our signaling and the lights which responded to us. One of the uh, people left early that night. As she was driving across the San Fernando Valley, she suddenly felt shaking of her vehicle. She got out, looked up at the back at the Santa Susana Pass where we were, and the lights were signaling at her as well. So there was this high strangeness component uh, that I felt as when I signaled at those lights, they responded in, with tremendous speed, strobe-like power that I could not reproduce with our primitive lights. I felt as if there was a consciousness link between my signaling and the intelligence behind the phenomena. Now, I thought we had been successful by our own methods. However, I found out that was not the case. And we're getting towards the break now. Is that correct? We got about uh, just a, about a minute 40. Right. So I thought that it was the consciousness techniques alone that had brought us all these anomalous phenomena. It turned out, however, that the UFOs were probably there already because the Department of Energy had a, a, a very important base in the Santa Susana Pass area. It was the uh, Ener Department of Energy site uh, where there had been a nuclear accident back in the 50s and had there had been actually a partial meltdown of a reactor. And this had strategic importance uh, because uh, I learned that that base was on Soviet strategic war fighting maps uh, in case there was a nuclear war, that base was targeted. At the end of the Cold War, those Russian maps were released. So I knew that this was a very important location, but it was years later when I found out that there was an act of sabotage by a UFO directed against that base which I'll get into when, during the uh, after we go to our first break. That's amazing. Sabotage by UFOs, working with Dr. Stephen Greer, chasing UFOs, trying to figure out what the experience, that is quite a life so far, Dr. Joseph Burks. So far, we haven't even scratched the surface yet with you. Yeah. And, of course, you know, the missus, my wife, was not interested at all. And this was an issue that all of the contact activists had to deal with. Their families who couldn't quite understand what we were doing or why we were doing it. But she tried to be supportive. And I said, hey, honey, at least it's better than golf. True. Anything's better than golf. You know, one of the greatest days of my life, Dr. Burks, was the, the day I quit golf. I've never been more happier in my life. Dr. Joseph Burks is with us on Science Bob and Friends. As we get into more UFOs, sightings, recordings, evidence, looking at CE5, Stephen Greer, we got it all tonight on Spaced Out Radio. All right, we're clear. Okay. Well, we got how much time? About five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Yeah. Hi, Jeremy Howdy. Jones. Hi, The Quick. How are you? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, we're already into a half an hour. Gosh, that went fast. It always does. Yeah. It always does. I don't know how we do it. So I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I, I don't know whether I shared this the last time. I suspect I covered a lot of the same material. Um, uh, you, have your, uh, you have your show's archived, right? What do you mean, dark eyed? Archived, archived in the sense archived, yeah, on YouTube, yes, yeah. So and all the podcasting too. Yeah, I'm not. I, I wish I had listened to the show. I could refer to it, but um, that's I, okay. I, it allows us to have more spontaneous fun, right? I'm going to get into uh, the, the 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 Department of Energy uh, incident, Department of Energy Lab incident. Uh, that demonstrated that the UFOs were not there alone for us, but they had been. Right. And uh, then I'll move over to uh, uh, the consciousness connection in terms of uh, 
an amazing series of sightings that happened the first month that we started our field work. Okay. And, yeah, we, um, we could go anywhere. Okay. At some point, I want to bring in the science connection because I, I think we should decom deconstruct uh, the scientific model as a as a paradigm that has utility in the UFO investigative field. And we'll talk about the reasons why science is not necessarily the best discipline to use. Sounds good. We can do it. Yes. Sir. Right. And then the, this uh, a substance should be on the virtual experience model uh, because that's that's the radical concept that I want to leave our listeners with so that they understand that every light in the sky is not a, an ET spacecraft with friendly ETs or marauding uh, abdu alien abductionists. Yeah, that I do know. That I do know. I just wish that the aliens would come back. I got some words for them. Like, it's time to take me in for a flight. And I want to be conscious. None of this knock me out crap. Just land in my backyard, pick me up, and let's go. It requires very special training to, for that to happen. I know some people that have had that experience, or at least have memories of onboard experiences. We can talk a little bit about those kind of people. They're they're very special, and they um, they have intense programs of consciousness raising uh, that re it typically involves lots of meditation. I I had the pleasure of meeting a twelve year old girl here in my town who has flown the ship. A lot of those um, flying the ship experiences are in a matrix-like reality, which may or may not correspond to the 3D reality that we call um, everyday reality. Well, uh, all I know is uh, is that it's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting. Oh yeah, and they all say the same thing. How do you fly the ship with your mind? Exactly. Exactly. And you know what I I told my audience? I said, "Isn't it weird that back in 1986, Disney did a movie called Flight of the Navigator, which is exactly about that?" Interesting. Yeah. Well, the the um, if you follow... here, here's the weird part about that. Sorry to cut you off. Mm -hmm. Weird part about that is I recently found out the character's name who flies the ship. His first two names are Dave Scott. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of weirded me out. That's cute. Weirded, weirded me out. We have about uh, 45 seconds here, boss. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, 27 seconds. A uh, big thank you to Fabster, Patrick, uh, Tessa, uh, Double Tim, and uh, Nicola and Chad for the amazing super chats. Really appreciate the love and support that you give us. Thank you to all the veterans out there listening to the show. You always have a, a safe home here with us. And, of course, to all the regulars tuning on in and hanging out, uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Here we go. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot, 
at Reading Up on Captain Shirks, SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Dr. Joseph Burks. We're talking ETs, contact, the science behind what are UFOs and extraterrestrials. Dr. Burks, welcome back. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. I want to ask you right off the bat, because I know there was a couple things that you want to discuss this half hour, but first and foremost, I, I just want to ask you about Dr. Stephen Greer for a couple of minutes, because, sure. I mean, he has gone from a real leader in this field to somebody who's become a, a controversial anomaly on his theories, on the way he's doing things, how much money he is charging people to to make this contact he won't do interviews unless he uh, knows the questions beforehand H has all of this ufo success gone to his head i would if i were asked to give a yes or no answer i would say yes but it was a long way in getting there and uh, to understand stephen greer you have to realize that uh, he was approached by the intelligence services very early in his uh, journey. Uh, if you read Grant Cameron's excellent analysis, Managing Magic, uh, or not, you can read the book or, or watch one of his many uh, re re webinars, you see that Stephen Greer fit into a pattern of what you might call UFO messiahs. These are people who are used by executive branch intelligence services to carry out what you might call a gradual acclimatization of uh, the, the public. So you had in the 1980s, Bill Moore, who self-destructed when he revealed he was uh, working for the intelligence services and played a role in uh, uh, confounding a poor, poor, poor Paul Benowitz. And then in the night starting in 2015, you have uh, Tom DeLong, who gets a set of advisors who are giving him information on the subject. So Stephen Greer historically fits between those two bookends. And he was approached by, I won't mention uh, who his case officer was and still is because he's operational. Uh, but he, uh, he, uh, he was uh, told that he could play a role in this kind of gradual acclimatization. And he met with Woolsey in 1993. I was part of the C-SETI leadership when that meeting was set up. People have claimed that this did not happen. It did happen. And so for several years, that while I was in the C-SETI leadership, I saw how the intelligence services were feeding him information and having him be a kind of front man for the faction within the military industrial intelligence complex including the executive branch that wanted more openness on this subject. Now, in the early days, he was working as a physician. And, uh, you know, he was an ER doctor working many long hours, making a good living. Once he dedicated himself totally to uh, the cause of disclosure, uh, he was basically without income. And so that's when the money issues became more and more prominent. He charged thousands of dollars for a week seminar. Uh, and he got into a lot of financial schemes, uh, investments which were of dubious nature, uh, where people were told they were investing in free energy and raised money for labs, free energy labs. But he had no expertise in either physics, free energy, or running a lab. And so when these projects uh, did not come to fruition, all the money that was raised went back to Stephen Greer. So these are the th kinds of issues that happened that caused people to be very disenchanted with him. Uh, however, he played a historic role in the Disclosure Project, uh, which advanced a lot of important information. And he was, uh, in terms of North American or English-speaking countries, his CE5 initiative, which uh, I was a participant in the early days, promoted the idea of hum human-initiated contact experiences. So. I, I can't imagine what he must be going through working so many years, decades, trying to be the point person on disclosure and have a, a younger, more popular upstart like Tom DeLong follow a path 
along similar lines that he had, but be far more successful than he was able to achieve. So Stephen Greer, I, I, I'm sorry to say, uh, is suffering from the green disease, in my judgment. Uh, he's suffering from envy, and it colors his whole analysis. His current uh, theories are without adequate substantiation. He, he's basically become a very divisive force attacking Lou Elizondo, Jim Semivan, Dr. Jacques Vallée, and many other people who have played a very po positive role in advancing more openness on this topic. Uh, that's ne Nevertheless, one has to think of Stephen Greer as a kind of agent of influence who was working for a period of time and still, to a certain extent, I suspect, for the executive branches of the United States Intelligence Services, as well as uh, for the intelligence behind the phenomena. His ability to attract the phenomena has decreased, as reported by people who go into the field with him and nothing happens. It's, but it's a very complicated situation where some people are having sightings and others are not. And this gets into the, the virtual experience model where this intelligence behind the phenomena can actually target people to have sightings, whereas those standing next to them won't see a thing. Well, the one thing that I have noticed with Dr. Greer over the last couple of years, he's really trying to target that younger audience. Earlier this year, he went on the very popular YouTube podcast uh, with Logan Paul, who has millions of viewers and fans on YouTube. He has teamed up with with uh, Demi Lovato regarding UFOs and CE5 contact. And I always found that kind of interesting because one of the questions I posed to my audience uh, a couple of days ago was, I wonder if Demi paid the $3,500 for the course. Somehow I don't think so. You know, he wasn't, because he wasn't always like that. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when he started off, he started within a model of, social kind of social movement that I was accustomed to. It became a small, very financially successful family business as time went on when he no longer could, could support himself and his family as a physician. So uh, it's unfortunate that that's the model he chose. I understand the reasons why, uh, but a lot of what he's doing now is, is not very positive. Although the concept that he's linked to historically, I believe in still, but I prefer to use the term HICE, human initiated contact event, rather than CE5, because it does not have the same kind of uh, taboo linking to Stephen Greer with all his strengths and his many weaknesses. In addition, uh, it's clear to me that the scientific model is not necessarily the best one to use in engaging the intelligence behind the phenomena. We can talk about that a bit, if you like. I, I, I just want to disagree with you on something here, because I think disagreement it makes for good conversation and good debate. I don't believe for a second the Tom DeLong story. It sounds way too easy, way too manipulated, and just seeing how Tom has acted through everything, I don't like to give him a lot of credit for the success and then the falling apart of the To the Stars Academy. I've always been very critical of his, the story and the efforts on how he all of a sudden got involved with that. I mean, that could open up a, a, a three-hour conversation regarding that. But do you really buy into the fact that Tom just happened to be invited to a, a – family luncheon at, at Lockheed Skunk Works and then just happened to be invited to talk to generals in Washington, D.C. I mean, he was nobody. He was much like you, much like me, much like anybody else. Sure, he had rock star status. Sure, he had millions of followers on social media. But in the end, when it came to this subject, he was a nobody like the rest of us. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, this was not something that Tom DeLong was the source of. It was an operation that started when a faction within the executive branch that's been pushing for more openness on this decided they would go with Tom DeLong, and they gave him the, the generals 
and the intelligence officers they, who met with him and created the, the model for To The Stars Academy. This was an operation which is very similar to what St Stephen Greer went through as well. They need a front man. They need someone for what's called plausible deniability. The president can't get up there and give out information because it's the, the as Grant Cameron has explained, it's the hottest political, the hottest political potato you can ever grab hold of. So they use people um, like Moore and Dr. Greer and Tom DeLong as front men who, who allow the information to get out and make it appear as if this is a citizen's effort, when in reality, it's the result of a faction within the military industrial complex that wants this issue to, to come forward and have not full disclosure, but what, you, what we have now is confirmation of the reality of the phenomena. Right. And, and that's and that's exactly what I believe. I mean, I think he was a put up patsy that if it failed, he'd be the fall guy. I mean, why not? I mean, he's a guy who's made $50 million over his lifetime in music. He doesn't need the money. He, well, he may now after his divorce, but he doesn't at the time didn't need the money. He had an interest. He had everything good looking young guy. Lots of people, both old and young, uh, follow him because of the music, interest in UFOs. And where the, I'll tell you, the immediate uh, uh, part where I all of a sudden saw two red flags was in that opening press conference. All right. And that was, that was number one, coming from as a journalist and working in mainstream media. How do you have a pressless press conference? They uh, could have. They could have blown this subject up if they would have had any media there in Seattle during that press conference. The press conference was a, a part of a, a strategy that would bring in the New York Times, Political, and the Washington Post and allow the main players in that effort, Chris Mellon, Lou Elizondo, and the others, to initiate a new phase of more openness on this topic. This was something that was planned for not months, but probably years. We were getting rumors of this. Grant Cameron with his connections was saying something major is gonna happen in 2016 and 2017. They didn't expect Trump to win, uh, but if Hillary Clinton was elected, she was gonna be the, uh, UFO confirmation president. And they had to reorganize when things, uh, when she was not very popular and she lost, even though she got more popular votes, that's the way that our system works here, unfortunately, different from Canada. So they had to regroup and they were able to go forward with it. And this was an operation. By the way, I don't see anything wrong with it. The reason I feel this era of new openness is more very important because we cannot have a social movement that demands disclosure as long as most people think this issue is, is, is ridiculous. So having authority figures, the New York Times, getting the Congress involved, sets the stage for a very important advocacy, which we're happening, we're seeing right now. Uh, recently was a very important effort uh, that was called the phone home from the group. Yes. The... Uh, Unknown, uh, so, uh, unidentified celebrity review. Right, unidentified celebrity renew, review, and so this is what we're getting the ball rolling in terms of creating a social movement, because just like in the peace movement, we had a slogan which was when the people lead, then the leaders will follow. Same thing as when it comes to disclosure, when the people lead, mount a campaign, letter writing, perhaps demonstrations all the effort will be from the people that'll be decisive in the long run. The other thing that flagged me in that conference with Tom was, was the fact that when you looked at the people who were on stage one way or another, they had all had ties to Robert Bigelow. Right. Well, Robert Bigelow has been working in this field for 30 years and he's given probably more than any individual in the United States, 
to open this this question up. So he's he's a very powerful individual, and he's sponsored the investigations of his NIDS group, new um, uh, NIDS. I forget the acronym what it stands for. Discovery Science, I think, national, and and so he he. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, he went on 60 Minutes and said first confirmation occurs and somewhere down the line disclosure will happen. And this is the this is the model that's being followed. This is the plan. But it's not enough to leave it in the executive branch. And when it comes to disclosure, I'm of the opinion that it's the people's disclosure movement in terms of individuals who are having encounters with the intelligence, engaging them every way we can, physically, telepathically. This is what's going to open up our civilization to contact, not an announcement by an authority figure, which may never come. Uh, so I want to share with the audience some of the successes and surprising developments we had uh, working at, in human-initiated contact. Please do. We got six and a half minutes before we go to break at the top of the hour. Dr. Joseph Burks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, Science Bob and Friends. Go ahead, Doc. What are those initiatives? Well, so in 1992, we, I had a contact team operating in the Santa Susana Pass. Mentioned it was near the Department of Energy. And we were having many sightings. I thought they were for us. But in 2006, I was working in the emergency room and I was admitting a patient to the hospital and I typically asked them what their occupation was. He said he was an operating engineer for the Department of Energy Research Lab in Santa Susana Pass, where my team had operated. So I asked him, have you ever had a UFO sighting? And he paused, looked around the room as if to say, is anyone gonna hear this? Because he didn't wanna share it with anyone but me. And what he said was that around 19, 89, 1990, about two years before our team went into the field, he was in the control room for the lab when the alarms went off. Now, this lab had had a nuclear meltdown in the 1950s, and in order to pr provide water to the labs, there were these enormous water towers that carried water down the mountainside and into the underground aspects of the base. The alarm said that there was a break in one of the water lines and they had to repair it. This was something that happened from time to time uh, when there would be landslides. The, the geology there is sandstone. So it's, he grabbed his machete and he and his coworker started going down the mountain to find where there had been a break in the pipe to repair it. They got to a clearing and they saw a jet of water shooting up from a pipe that had been broken, but there was no debris around it. When he looked at the pipe, he saw that it had been cleanly cut in a nice, like a power tool or a laser, and the water was shooting up. And as he glanced across the clearing, he saw a 30 foot flying disc that was spinning about 20 feet off the ground. It looked as if that had been sabotaged by the, the UFO. He gets on the squawk box, call security, and they said something that turns out to be kind of funny. They said, whatever you do, don't approach the craft. Well, he and his buddy were shaking in their boots. That was the last thing they were going to do. Before the security squad with the M16s got down there, the flying saucer turned on its side and with a roar took off and was, was gone. The next day, as typical, the suits from Washington came and he was debriefed. Uh, they, were, they tried to tell him that what he saw was not a flying saucer, but he knew what he saw and he shared that information with me. So that when we started doing field work in the Santa Susana Pass and the UFOs were there, I suspect we were not the reason why necessarily. Now in that first month, uh, we had sightings, not only at the research station, but also three people in our team had personal sightings that were highly congruent. On September 4th, 1992, I had gone to a, a meeting where I discussed the research we were doing in a, a prestigious UFO study group, Los Angeles UFO study group. And I was a little bit wet behind the collar. I said, you know, 
we have this new consciousness mediated techniques, we can attract UFOs, and we can do real-time research. The advantage over doing real-time research prospectively is that you have your team in place and can get a lot more data than if you interview someone as MUFON does a week or a month or a year after the event. So as I was driving home from the meeting, and I was not very popular there because I basically said that they were old fuddy-duddies and that this new prospective program was going to replace the traditional ufology, I saw a blue-green light coming across the Los Angeles basin. I was on the 405 freeway. The light was moving in a serpentiginous way. It was not a helicopter. It was not a small plane. It was a nocturnal light that was truly anomalous. When I got home, I said to my wife, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is I'm never gonna be invited to the prestigious LA UFO study group. The good news is I just saw a UFO. 19 days later, one of the people who was associated with our team, Dr. Eve Gordon, uh, she um, was driving in around five in the afternoon across the San Fernando Valley. She was headed south, interesting, the same direction that I was headed. Her husband, Dave Gordon, was on our contact team. And as she was looking to the south, I think it was Canoga Boulevard, she saw a metallic disc glistening in the sun over the Santa Monica Mountains. She was a skilled observer because Dave Gordon, her husband, was a private pilot and they attended air shows. So she knew what every conventional type of craft was supposed to look like. This was a flying disc hovering about three to five miles away. It was maybe 30, 50 feet across. The next night, Dotha Weyburn, who was the wealthy air woman in our group, and she was a skilled meditator. She attended a meditation seminar in the, the evening of the September 24th. And as she was driving south to the Palos Verdes Peninsula, up this long driveway, she looks above her house, which had a beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean, and she sees a light that she's never seen before above her house. As she's driving the dr up the driveway, the light starts coming down towards her, and she sees it's a 25 to 30 foot glowing mother of pearl orb. And as she's looking at it, she receives the telepathic message, you were looking for us in your field work. Well, here we are. Wow. And then turns and goes across the Pacific uh, to the West. That is a... Uh... Awesome, awesome story. When we come back with you, Dr. Joseph Burks, I want to get more into the scientific side of the UFO phenomena. What have we learned scientifically about these craft? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from space? Are they coming from other dimensions? Are they time travelers? Are they interdimensional? Are they from inner Earth? Do they ever stop at the McDonald's drive through at 3 o'clock in the morning? Dr. Joseph Burks is here for Science Bob and Friends. We'll be back on Spaced Out Radio right after this. All right, we're clear. All right, so that that those three cases establishes the consciousness connection that they, they were all time our encounters in a very highly congruent way. I don't think they had put uh, trackers on our cars. They knew who we were and they knew where we were and they could stage these encounters in highly congruent way, thus verifying the consciousness connection. So I'm gonna get into that. Sure, we can do that. We can go wherever you want because tonight's all about you. I think the extraterrestrial hypothesis is uh, not the likely exclusive explanation. We'll, we'll talk about that. Perfect. Perfect. We've got about five minutes to formulate some questions and answers. Let's see here. All right.
IHL Westlake, how you doing? Oh, hey, Phoenix1969. Yeah, say hi to ufologist for us if you don't mind. Alien Critter, are you wearing a, uh, Dave, are you wearing a zip-up vest? I am. I am. Thanks, Backspin. Appreciate that. Uh, Commonwealth Andrew, how you doing this morning? <clears throat> Good night, Magnus. Well, thank you, Jen A. Hey, Don D., how are you? Sweet Tony D., how are you? Thanks, Clam. Got it. Remember, everybody, you can be Chad Smith, too. We're all Chad Smith. All Chad Smiths are welcome here. That is very true. We got about uh, two minutes, boss. Two minutes. Alien Critter, I will never have an, a Maple Leaf hat in here. Come on. Come on. That hurts. That hurts. All right. Hi, Gorgeous Cat. How you doing? Oh, hey, Clam. The lovely and talented Magic Maiden. I flew into Toronto once, Alien Critter, and before I even landed, I got hives from all the Leafs and Blue Jays fans. Hives, I tell you. Thank God I caught a connector. One minute. All right. I want to say a big thank you to Backspin, to Alicia, Fabster, Patrick, Double Tim, Tessa, Chad, and Nicola for the amazing super chats tonight. Thank you so much for the love and support. Thank you to all the veterans who are tuned on into this show. We love you. You always got a safe home here. And, of course, to all of our regulars who are tuned on in nightly here. And we really appreciate it. And uh, we appreciate your support each and every night sharing this show spreading the word and the love of SOR. We appreciate it. And we're going to get going here in about 10 seconds. Science Bob is not here tonight. He had a family emergency happen. Hey, Mr. Cowley, welcome back to the show. Mr. Cowley loves his space out radio. Here we go.
You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are in this beautiful planet we call Earth. Want to remind you that you can listen to all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Thank you to everyone tuning us in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Quadrumanus. Quadrumanus is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Science Bob and Friends, Dr. Bob McGuire. He is absent tonight due to a family emergency, but we are still joined by our special guest, Dr. Joseph Burks. We are talking the science behind UFOs. Dr. Burke, welcome back. Thanks again. It's good to be here. All right. Now, right before the break, you told us three stories about experiencers out there. You believe this is all tied to consciousness. Absolutely. Uh, those three sightings were highly congruent, and there was an escalation of the intensity and the significance. I had a sighting of a nocturnal light. My colleague, Eve Gordon, had a sighting of a metallic disc. And the third sighting by Dotha Weyburn was of a globe hovering above her house. And as it flew by, it said, you were looking for us, meaning we were doing human-initiated contact. Well, here we are. So this was highly congruent that we were all in our own vehicles, all driving home, all headed south. These were staged events. They're not random. And the intelligence behind the phenomena, whether it be extraterrestrial or something stranger yet, was sending us a message that they had recognized who we are, who we were, and they could contact us at any time. And as strange as it may seem, from the, my years of working in the field, the intelligence behind the phenomena can con access our consciousness as readily as you and I access light at home by turning on a wall switch. So the consciousness connection is at the center. And any investigation of UFOs that does not acknowledge this and do dive into it is missing the point completely. The consciousness aspect is so argued in this field, Dr. Burks, on whether or not there is something to it. Have any scientists that you know outside of yourself started dealing with the consciousness aspect and whether or not it can create some sort of contact? Absolutely. Uh, I've been associated with uh, a new organization, uh, which is called the Institute. It's called the Contact excuse me, Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, CCRI. And it came out of a group of scientists, physicians, UFO researchers who were part of what was called FREE, the Foundation for Research into Extraordinary and Extraterrestrial Encounters. And that had Edgar Mitchell in it, as well as a number of other very prominent uh, people. And we are exploring the consciousness connection as the central aspect, not only of UFO contact, but what are called the contact modalities, which include shamanistic experiences, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and magic, even magic mushrooms. So what we see is that the common thread between all these anomalous experiences is mind or consciousness. And unfortunately, uh, so much of the UFO research community has been hung up for the last 70 years in the hardware. You have MUFON to this day 
going ad nauseum, I have to say, in terms of taking down citing reports, uh, and yet they're not really studying the contact experiences in, in, as a focus of their work. They do have a alien abduction, or now they call it a, an experiencers committee, but the, the vast majority of researchers in MUFON are dutifully taking down reports of what they imagine are hardware. And if the consciousness connection is primary, and if this intelligence can create illusion, which is as a me me mechanism of contact, then a lot of what people are seeing out there do not necessarily represent three-dimensional, you can kick the tires sort of objects. They may be thought projections, which the intelligence transmits to us uh, and do not correspond to any physical object. So unfortunately, if what I'm saying is true, MUFON in many instances has been chasing shadows for the last 70 years. So we have to create a new science of consciousness in order to engage the phenomena. And this is what groups like the CU5 initiative, which I was part of for many years, and Mission Rama, which is a group of Peruvian contactees who had amazing contact experiences. And some of their people have even been able to enter into dimensional portals, which allegedly are used to teleport contact activists to other, other places. We can talk about that as well. So the emphasis has to be on mind and not on the hardware if we're going to make any progress in this field. Well, before we get into that, I think a big question that a lot of us have, Dr. Burks, is where are they, whoever they are, coming from? Is it space? Is it interdimensional? Are they ultra-terrestrial? Are they from different timelines? Are they time travelers from the future coming back here? What is going on? Because this is all part of the great debate. We all think of little green men coming from the sky, but this may not be the full answer. Absolutely. Uh, I recommend that all pe people in the audience get a hold of the books of Jacques Vallée and John Keel. These are two giants when it comes to putting forward an alternative to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. The element of absurdity uh, that exists within the contact experience, their ability to create illusion, makes it possible for them to come from not only possibly outer space, but from other dimensions. The way in which their so-called craft can wink in and out of existence uh, is reminiscent of what pe how people describe ghosts. And so if we're looking for an exclusive cause for the phenomena and putting it into the extraterrestrial pocket, I think we're going to really shortchange ourselves because this is far more complex uh, because this phenomena has been here throughout recorded history. And the notion that they just sort of arrived in late 1940s when we got into nuclear technology and excited the so-called Galactic Federation is, is a, a simplistic explanation that denies contact experiences that go back perhaps even to the Stone Age. Okay, so what kind of scientific studies are we doing in order to track where these craft are coming from, or can we do that at this point? Well, I think we can listen to the experiencers, but take, take their um, information with, with a grain of salt. Uh, remember, this, this intelligence has tremendous psychic and physical capabilities. And if John Keel is correct, that they have, they, meaning the others, the, the intelligence behind the phenomena, has been in the belief system forever, then at our level of development, we may not be able to handle the truth about who and where they are. And I say this uh, with some trepidation because it's possible that all our wisdom traditions are the result. I'm talking about organized religion are the reflection of interactions with intelligences that now appear to us as extraterrestrials. And this would be a very destabilizing concept for the belief systems. So we have to gradually 
become accustomed to not only the presence of the others, but to work through the theological, the ideological controversies that such knowledge would entail. So to answer your question, will we find out within my lifetime? Not likely. But if we continue to engage the phenomena as contact activists have, there's the possibility that we could have more openness and equality in our interactions. After all, right now, we are the passive partner in the, con in the contact drama. The intelligence behind the phenomena decides who they're going to contact, where, when, and how. They control almost every aspect of our engagement with them. The thing they can control completely is how we're going to feel about it, our reactions to it. And the reactions are very diverse. Some people are terrified. But as these their interactions increase over time, the number of people who are frightened by their contacts decreases. And the number of people who become more familiar with it and can have more meaningful exchanges with the phenomena increases. And this was seen in the free study where thousands of contact experiences answered detailed survey questions, so over 500. And what we found in the survey was as the number of contacts that people had with the phenomena increased, the number of positive attitudes about the phenomena increased. So those who had one or two or three experiences were absolutely shocked. It's called ontological shock, that, that these beings are here and they can access us at will. And we react to any unknown being as a potential predator. It's, we're hardwired in terms of our evolution. But as the number of contact experiences for an individual increases, there's more opportunity for com communication and sharing. And so that's the hopeful part of it. Not that we'll never find out, but that as we build confidence between the intelligence behind the phenomena and ourselves, we could have more meaningful encounters and, and communication. Do you believe then that the threat narrative is quite naive for people to believe? Well, there is a threat, but not necessarily for the people on planet Earth. I mentioned that this issue does threaten all terrestrial elites, but in my judgment, not the interests of peace-loving people on the planet. There are those who are demented enough uh, to think that they can actually fight against extraterrestrials. It's a fantasy that's completely ridiculous because as our contacts have shown, their psi capability is so, so powerful that they could confound any soldier or any pilot who sent against them. They have access to our full repertoire, our full storehouse of memories. And from my research, it seems clear that they can project into the consciousness of any contact experiencer uh, a virtual reality type of environment. I call that a virtual experience of the second kind, a full sensory type of illusion that is reminiscent of what people saw in the fictional account of the matrix. In fact, contact experiencers who took the free survey describe many of their encounters as being more real than real and taking place in a kind of matrix reality. Well, this, if this intelligence can do this to contact experiencers, imagine what they could do to any general who imagines they can fight against them. It, it's impossible to wage war against such an intelligence. Nevertheless, for those who are invested in the national security state, which says the airspace above very sensitive locations has to be defended at all costs, the intelligence is a threat but not of people who are in the spirit of peace and cooperation are attempting to build ties between them. So the threat narrative depends on who you ask. For someone who wants to have world peace and environmental survival, the idea of downloading into our technological culture under conditions of peace and cooperation, the wonders of their energy producing systems, they are not a threat, they're a promise. Same applies to medicine. 
as part of that, my research with the free group, Preston Dennett and I got a chance to interview some of the people from that survey who had healings as a result of their contacts. In fact, of those who answered the question, have you or anyone within your family had a healing as a result of your contact with UFO intelligence? 50%, over 750 people, 50% of those who answered the question said indeed they did. So this intelligence has the capability not only of frightening people and sometimes physically harming them, but it has the capacity of carrying out astounding cures, which I could enumerate if we have the opportunity during this. Interview. We do have the time right now. We got seven minutes until break. Well, you know, what What does a DE agent uh, who has a retinal, uh, uh, excuse me, who has a corneal avulsion have in common with a young doctor who had a mishap when his wisdom tooth was rem removed and he had uncontrolled bleeding or a prominent educator have who suffered 25 years uh, from chronic fatigue syndrome. What these contact experiences have in common is that all of them were healed as a result of their interactions with the phenomena. This DE agent was, not only did he have one healing in terms of corneal avulsion, which was traumatic, was healed by the intelligence behind the phenomena, but he also had a lung mass the size of his fist diagnosed on x-ray. And as he was entering into the hospital to have bronchoscopy and possibly surgery, inside the x-ray suite of that hospital, he had a contact experience and he was healed bloodlessly. The repeat chest x-ray was done, the mass was gone. This is a, an astounding level of healing technology, which if under conditions of peace and cooperation, it would be safe to download into our technological culture the secrets of their not only propulsion systems, but healing modalities would lead to a great advance in terms of medical science. So this is what we have as a promise with more open contact, more equal contact. And this is the goal of the contact networks that I've been involved with, whether it be the CE5ers, or Mission Rama, and there are dozens of other independent groups who are in operation who have been told by the intelligence behind the phenomena, I'm convinced, they've been told, fly under the radar and not seek publicity. Because unfortunately, human-initiated contact teams have been infiltrated, we have had surveillance, and uh, this has been an ongoing issue in terms of our operations. Very true. Okay. So does that not lead to a cover up or a narrative that continues to be played out in order to either A, protect the government or B, protect the citizens of this, this world? Well, I'm not sure what they're protecting us from uh, by keeping a UFO cover up in place. Uh, I, I think that we have opportunities by, in terms of what I just out outlined when the people work together on this planet and realize that we're one race of beings on one homeland, the pressure for planetary unity is going to increase. Already we see English is the second language for the entire planet. The internet has created tremendous opportunities for communication, commerce, we're becoming a world civilization. And I'm of the opinion that if we can create a world civilization based on cooperation and social and environmental justice, the intelligences behind the phenomena would be willing to transfer to us some of their technology. But under conditions that we now operate on, these weapons, or should these advanced technologies would be used primarily for weapons development. So we're going to have to have a new kind of United Nations, one a world government not based on manipulation, but on cooperation. And many people are frightened of that. But after all, just thinking back in history, at one time in Europe, nations didn't exist. Feudal barons constantly in war with one another. 
And when nations were created ending feudalism, there was tremendous advance. I believe in a similar fashion, a world government based on cooperation would allow our civilization to advance as the existence of nations allowed our civilization to advance some two, 300 years ago. Okay. Let's get to a couple audience questions here, if you don't mind. And, and let's start off with, let me see here. Uh, where are they? Aaron is asking, can you expound on the science behind the craft's propulsion systems? I, I can tell you that from my contact with the intelligence behind the phenomena and my interviews with people who have had high strangeness experiences where they've actually believe they've flown the ship, that the ships are operating on a basis of consciousness. It's conceivable that these craft have are a kind of artificial intelligence that allows them to be sentient. And if you have that degree of technology, um, then the sky's the limit. These intelligences are probably ancient, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe tens of millions of years more advanced than us. And if that be the case, then it seems likely that they are using some kind of non-polluting energy that is able to extract so-called free energy in the vacuum of space and utilize it. Now, I've had my own contact experiences in which, um, strangely enough, I was in communication with the intelligence beh behind these craft, and I was led to believe that they are awake and they are sentient. That doesn't exactly answer the question as to the propulsion systems, but I think the opinion of many investigators is that these advanced systems of energy propulsion are likely free energy coming from the vacuum of space. But the more important question is, can we evolve an Earth civilization that's cooperative and not use these advanced technologies for weapons of war? That's the critical question, my judgment. Dr. Burks, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. We are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour as Dr. Joseph Burks is here for Science Bob and Friends. The science behind UFOs and ET contact. What statistics do we really have? What can we prove? What is all hypothetical information, theory? We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio on Science Bob and Friends and Dr. Joseph Burks. <clears throat> All right, we're clear for five minutes. All right, so maybe I should get into the healing cases. Sure. That, that's probably safe. The politics can get very... Uh, I don't want to bore, uh, bore your audience with my diatribes on world peace. No worries. We can go into healing and everything. Yeah, you know, the healing cases are astounding. I'm losing my voice. Not good for radio. Yeah, I'm going pretty thick too. We were we're now at ten thirty. Yep. So we go for another hour. Another hour. Well, technically, only about. 49 minutes. Okay. When you add in the commercial breaks for this one and uh, the top of the hour. I, I should, uh, after I do the healing cases, I think we should just focus on the virtual experience model. And I'll, I'll give some of the case, some of my own personal contact experiences that led me to believe that many sightings are not physical 
craft, but virtual. Right. I'll, just, I'll run through that. Right. <clears throat> My throat is killing me. Hi, gorgeous Christy Belly. <clears throat> Tell you, if I didn't have my fisherman's friend's cough candies today, I'd be a dead man. How much time we have? We got uh, one minute and 20 seconds. Thank you to Backspin, Alicia, Fabster, Patrick, Double Tim, Tessa, Chad, and Nicola for the awesome super chats tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you to all our veterans tuning in to our show tonight. Hi, gorgeous Gloria. How you doing? Good to have you here. And and a big thank you to all of our regulars in the chat room tonight, including Fap and the size of his head. We appreciate that. We'll get going here right now. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR News Wire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. 
We continue on tonight with Dr. Joseph Burks. It's Science Bob and Friends minus Science Bob McGuire tonight, as Dr. McGuire had a family emergency that he had to attend to, and he'll be joining us next time. And But he passes his condolences that he couldn't be here with all of you tonight. Dr. Burks has been working the last couple of decades trying to figure out this whole ET thing, and we're going to get into healings right now because there are a lot of people who make claims, Dr. Burke, that they have been healed by this extraterrestrial presence. Yes. As I mentioned before, the uh, free experiencer survey uh, of the 1,500 people who asked were asked, have you or anyone within your family been healed? Half of them, about 750 said, and then 35% claimed that they had actually had a healing. Now, a lot of these cases are difficult to evaluate from the medical point of view because in order to really assess a medical healing, you need to have a doctor's records, you need to examine the patient, and when you have 750 people making such claims, uh, the cost of doing an in-depth uh, investigation uh, is prohibitive. So what we did was we tried to find 10 of the most striking, dramatic cases, and we made every effort we could to get medical records. In as much as these healing cases occurred 20, 30 years prior, there, there, are, there are no records but we nevertheless were able to carry out in-depth interviews. And my co were this uh, part of the investigation, which if, by the way, if you want to read more about the uh, findings of the free survey is in a book called Beyond UFOs. And chapter six is the one written by Preston Denna and, and myself, where we get into 10 healing cases. Now, one of the cases uh, that I mentioned was Alberto Fernandez. And he was a DEA agent, Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, he grew up in uh, Cuba. And this was under uh, the uh, dictatorship of uh, Batista. And the, when the Cuban Revolution occurred, uh, there was an opportunity for people who were opposed to the communist government to flee. And so it was, I think it was Operation Peter Pan, where children, teenagers, often unaccompanied by parents, were transported out, out of Cuba. He entered the US military as a young man, was uh, trained to pop possibly going back to fight against the dictatorship. However, after the Bay of Pigs invasion and then the death of Kennedy uh, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, that those plans were Put away. He became a, a, a Miami police officer, and he had his first dramatic sighting of a UFO when he was coming off a, a nighttime patrol, and he saw what th first he thought was a helicopter hovering above his house. As he got closer, he realized there was no sound. It was a hamburger-shaped UFO about 30 feet across. Following that event for 10 years, he had several times a month terribly frightening encounters where he would sense an alien presence in his room at night and he would pass out. And in the morning, he would feel as if he had been engaging in sexual intercourse all night long. In other words, for 10 years, he had what he appeared to be semen sampling as a result of the encounter with his intelligence. After he left the police department, he became a Drug Enforcement Administration agent. He traveled to the Dominican Republic. He was so successful in operations that the corrupt police reportedly took a contract out on his life and he had to relocate back to the United States. And while he was being put up in a fancy hotel on, on the, in the top floor, he had another contact experience. This time, it wasn't as before, a, t a terrifying presence. Instead, a ET being that he sensed was female 
porpoise-like in appearance with glistening skin, gray in color, came to his bed. He was not paralyzed as he had been in previous encounters. He was not frightened. The being telepathically communicated saying that they thanked him for the years of his participation in their experiments. They promised never to frighten him and paralyze him as they had in the past. And they kept their word, never happened again. But his interest in the UFO subject increased. He then became an activist after he left the Drug Enforcement Administration. He became involved with Mission Rama, which is a group of Peruvian contactees, who contact workers, I would call them. And he actually had experiences where he was able to go into a dimensional portal. Uh, and this is what the, the Rama people call a Zendra. These dimensional portals are allegedly used to teleport people to other dimensions and other planets. While he was retired from his work as a DEA officer about 15 years ago, he had a traumatic accident. He was at a party and an elderly lady started to collapse. Being a tough guy, he grabbed her, tried to save her, but he couldn't support the weight. And they both fell and he struck his eye, his right eye on the corner of her chair and it tore off the cornea of his eye. He had a corneal avulsion. He was blind in that eye. He wanted, he, his wife wanted him to go to the emergency room which he did, but there was so much massive swelling from the air because he also sustained fractures of the orbit that the eye could not be examined. He was told he had to see a specialist, but being somewhat, well, if, if you know Cuban men, sometimes they can be very stubborn. He refused to go see the doctors because the next day they had spent thousands of dollars for a cruise to Alaska against his wife's uh, admonitions, they got on the cruise, but he was blind in that eye and the swelling was enormous. He went to see the cruise doctor and the do cruise doctor looked at him and said, this is terrible. Your cornea has been torn off. You've got to, we'll, we're going to helicopter and fly you off the, the boat. He refused. He completed the um, cruise. And then he, back in Miami, he saw an eye doctor who said, you, you've clearly got a corneal, a, 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 it was a cor, a corneal avulsion. And the cornea is a, a very tough membrane that's usually moist, but because it, he had not received medical care, it was like a crumpled piece of cardboard in one corner of his eye. The, the eye surgeon pulled the remnant of the cornea back over the eye gave him drops, antibiotics, and said, you're probably not going to ever have normal vision in your eye. You may actually need a corneal transplant. That night, he had another visitation. He sensed the alien presence. He was not frightened. And he sensed that they were there to heal him. And a green laser-like light entered his injured right eye and it was like a machine gun, zap, 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 zap. The cornea repaired. It's interesting that we use lasers to repair eyes. And so they apparently the ETs were using a technology similar to what we use in our technology. The, 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 he had a complete healing of his eye. He could see perfectly from that eye. Four days later, he went to the doctor who was astounded that he was totally normal. But that wasn't the only healing. So about five years later, he had a history of prostate cancer. On, on a screening chest x-ray, his doctor told him, I have very bad news for you. You have a mass in your right lung. It was the size of his fist. He then went to a local hospital to be admitted. His wife, who was a PhD psychologist, met him at the hospital and went into the x-ray suite. And she was separated from her husband who was in a wheelchair by one of those screens that come down from the ceiling as he was waiting to have a repeat x-ray because they had to use the hospital's 
film, not the one from the doctor's office. As he was waiting there, his wife looked at the screen that hung from curtains that surrounded him and said there was like an energy, like a, a sine wave. The, the screen was moving up and down in a sine wave pattern. And he cried out to her in Spanish, ellos están aquí, ellos están aquí. They're here, they're here. She rushed to him and she found him shaking violently. And when he stopped the shaking, he said, ellos me curaron. They cured me. They repeated the x-ray, the mass that had been previously seen, which undoubtedly in a case like this, painless mass, in someone with a former history of cancer, undoubtedly it would have been diagnosed as cancer. The x-ray was perfectly normal. Now, this case is significant because people always ask, how can I get healed? What are the characteristics of people who are healed and as documented in these cases that can be found in Beyond UFOs chapter six that Preston Denon and I wrote up? One of the characteristics is that these are individuals who have had a lifelong history of involvement with the intelligence behind the phenomena. But there are exceptions to that rule. How are we doing on time? We have lots of time. We got about 11 minutes. But let me talk about another case, which is an exception, because this was a young emergency room doctor who had a complication from wisdom tooth sur surgery. Although he never had a sighting, he did have an experience of missing time. When he was a senior medical student, he, he decided he needed a pet. So he went to the local, uh, what you call pound or animal shelter. And he decided that he wanted to have a, a, a white cat. When he got there, the uh, person who worked at the animal shelter looked very strange. She had a strange f appearance to her, almost pear-shaped, heavy set. The woman said to him, um, we have a two for one sale. And the, the cat that you want, I, what did I say? It was a, he wanted a, a calico cat. I believe that Wait. was the cat. He wanted a calico cat. Wow. That is just so weird. So, so weird. The argument, though, to the uh, cases like this, and reading one of the comments in our chat room, based, this one comes from Andrew, yet millions of children go blind in Africa. Do you see where people have a tough time believing the healing factor of extraterrestrials? I think Dr. Burks is frozen on his end. <clears throat> we'll see if we can get him back here momentarily. As we continue on here on Space Dial Radio, Science Bob and Friends, and we'll just have to wait for Dr. Burks to come back in here and uh, get reloaded on his computer because he seems to have disappeared there for a quick second. But nonetheless... You know, do you buy the fact of extraterrestrials healing people? See, I have a tough time with that. I I'm sure it's happening. Much like one of God's little miracles, if you believe in God or whatever deity you may or may not believe in, that is your choice. And, uh, you know, but I have a... I have a real tough time with that. You know, literally children all over the place, not just children, but people all over the place who are struggling. And yet, for some reason, these certain people get these healings from extraterrestrials. It's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. Not jealous. But Andrew from the UK has a point here. Yet millions of people of children go blind in Africa. It kind of makes you wonder what is the role 
of extraterrestrials as they progress with people and more and more people come out and make contact and talk about that contact. This is where a lot of us grind our teeth and wonder whether the phenomena is real or not. What makes that person so special? That they get a healing, yet a 16-year-old battling cancer in children's hospital does not. Sound fair? I guess as humans, we always try to put the love and hate on everything. We can't help but do so, which is pretty sad. But that's the way it goes. Right? That's the way it goes. I don't know what to say about that. I really do not know what to say about that. It bugs me. I'm not going to lie. It bugs me because it's almost like there could be an ET agenda. What does that person have or what is that person doing regarding or something so special that they get healed and others don't? Spooky. Where's our cure for cancer? Exactly. Exactly. I'm not even going to go down the train path where billions of dollars is donated annually to cancer. We don't have very many cures for that horrid, horrid disease. My mother is a two-time survivor, thank goodness. But I have issues with that. All right. But why do they choose? Phoenix is saying... Dave, I don't think they just heal anybody. I think you're part of their experiment. Then your chances are a lot higher. I'm getting help. I think you have something there. But how do they choose who, who is part of their experiment? And what is the experiment? I think Dr. Burke's computer may have blown up. I don't know. We'll continue on here on Spaced Out Radio. Science Bob and Friends. That is a good point, though, Phoenix. It's almost like they don't want their studied animals, being us, to have any other debilitating diseases or anything happen while they're working on us. That would make sense. But we also know that there are miracles out there, religious miracles where people overcome major injury, sometimes even death, when they should be gone. It is a little bit uncomfortable to think that they, if the aliens are in control, are picking and choosing. Fap says, I don't believe in the aliens healing. They made no progress in making my head small enough to fit in a baseball cap. I'm back. I'm back. Yes, we got you. Dr. Jo Joseph Burke is here. We got about four minutes here before we got to go to break. For some, reason, for some reason, my uh, internet connection went out. I apologize. That's but, okay. Uh, anyway, to this uh, young doctor was not a, a contact experiencer. Uh, he was an ER doctor, um, but he had this very strange uh, missing time experience as a, as a uh, medical student, uh, but no sightings. He went to have his wisdom teeth taken out, and in the in the process, there was a complication where the inferior alveolar artery was inadvertently cut. It's a complication, so it's an arterial artery in the back of his jaw, and the surgeon who did the procedure was not aware of it. He he was he's had some oozing, and the doctor said just put some compression on it. Well, when he got home. 
the, uh, the, the clot was that had formed broke loose and he was hemorrhaging from an artery in his mouth that's connected to the uh, external carotid artery. So ev with every beat of his heart, his mouth filled with blood and that's called pulsatile bleeding. Uh, the only ER that could take care of him was the one where he worked. And like a lot of uh, doctors, uh, they're not always the best patients. So he hesitated instead of calling 911, he ran around, kept trying to put pressure on it. Pretty soon, rags, washcloths, paper towels were soaked with his own blood. He started getting shocky and panicky. He had no history of syncope, but at that point, he was looked in the mirror. He saw that he was white as a ghost and he was ashen gray and he passed out. The next thing he realized was he was, as they say, no longer in Kansas. He found himself floating in a room on a table-like structure, uh, was circular and the walls were made of metal and there were wires coming out of it. And he saw what he identified as an extraterrestrial floating in that space with him. Curiously enough, this was a very stout ET being. Usually they are reported as being emaciated. He then looked down where the floor should have been. And instead of seeing the floor, it was like a, a, a massive TV monitor showing the earth from space. So he assumed he was being healed. He was covered with white light. Boom. The next moment, he's back in bed, covered with blood, his own, but he felt fine. He was no longer shocky. His color was good. He, his uh, artery had been repaired. Now, this was curious because this was one case where he'd had no extensive history of contact. We have time for one more case. We got one minute. Okay, so I'll just set it up in saying that this is a case for chronic fatigue syndrome. A long-time experiencer who was disabled from, and I'll get into the medical details, but she had had contact experiences all her life. And over the years, she actually developed a friendly relationship with a tall gray who felt like family to her. And uh, she was healed and I'll give the details when we come back from the break. When you were kind of uh, having to reboot your computer, one of the things that we were talking about is how they pick and choose who gets healed and who doesn't. That is a real bone of contention with many people we could uh, potentially get into as well. Maybe you have some answer th for answers for that. Dr. Joseph Burke, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. We're going to go to break at the top of the hour. We got Dr. Joseph Burke on Science Bob and Friends for another 30 minutes. Then we'll be joined by John Hudson and the unbiased UFO report. The Newswire, the thought of the Dave. Stay tuned. A jam-packed hour three of Spaced Out Radio coming up next. I'm, I'm sorry about the... Uh... Oh, that happens. That happens. I, it just went out for no reason. I can't explain it. Um, it's never it happened, happened before. So, I'm going to take uh, take a quick bathroom break. I'll be All right then. back. I'm going to put you on mute here, and I'll be right back.
All right. My hair is so horrible tonight. <clears throat> All right, we got just over 90 seconds. When we get to the break at the bottom of the hour, just uh, hold through the break, and I'll say a proper good night to you then. Okay. All right. I want to say a big thank you to Jeremy, Backspin, Alicia, Fapster, Patrick, uh, Double Tim, Tessa, Chad, and Nicola for the great super chats that we have uh, going on, and we really uh, thank you for the love and support of Spaced Out Radio. Thank you so much for the veterans out there who are tuning us in you always got a safe home here and of course to all the regulars out there who are hanging on out each and every night we really appreciate each and every one of you we're going to get going with our number three here in about five seconds so sit tight here we go you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor third and final hour of spaced out radio is now underway my name is dave scott thank you so much for taking the time to join us we really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call earth we want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Quadrumanus. Quadrumanus is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce Science Bob and Friends. We do not have Dr. Bob McGuire tonight. He had a family emergency that he had to take care of out of town. But nonetheless, we are still joined by our special guest, Dr. Joseph Burks, who's been looking diligently over the last three decades into the UFO phenomena and ET contact phenomena. Right before the break, we were talking about healing and what goes along with that. And, you know, Dr. Burks, as I was saying right before the break, a lot of people seem to have issue with this as to why ETs would choose to heal some, and yet there are literally tens of thousands of children in Africa who could sure use some help. There's tens of thousands of children in North America and Europe sitting in children's hospitals dealing with very adult problems. You know, where are the aliens for that? Yeah. This is the, the question that comes up uh, when I give uh, public addresses. Uh, people ask me, how could I facilitate a healing for them? And all we can say is that the number of people in this planet who are having ongoing interactions with the extraterrestrials is only a small percentage of the population. If we look at people who have had sightings, and this has come somewhat controversial, but Reliable sources indicate that the prevalence of lifetime prevalence of having a UFO sighting is about 10%. Of those people who are having sightings, a percentage who, who are having ongoing interactions with beings is a much smaller number, 1%. 
Um, I started to talk a little bit about uh, one of the cases because the, qu the question was asked, why did you heal? Why did you heal me? And I'd like to share the, the, the history of a woman we're going to call Shannon. It's not a real name. She's a prominent individual. Uh, everyone in the show probably would recognize her name uh, in terms of science and UFOs. She had disabling chronic fatigue syndrome as, as a woman in her 30s. And for the next 20 years, you know, it's also known as um, myalgic encephalitis. And what chronic fatigue syndrome is, is a condition of unknown etiology that causes disabling fatigue. People will wake in the morning feeling exhausted as if they hadn't been able to sleep. Shannon became disabled from an occupation in which she was in a supervisory position. She was so disabled that her teenage daughter, she couldn't even make her lunch. Um, we don't know the cause of the disease, uh, but recent advances indicate that it probably has something to do with carbohydrate metabolism. In any case, Shannon was also a contact experiencer. And like Alberto, her contacts involved sexual harvesting, uh, harvesting of reproductive material. Every two or three months, she would have visitation, and she was under the impression that ovum were being removed from her ovaries. But over time, uh, she became familiar with the procedures, they were less frightening to her. And she had very strong emotional ties with one of the beings who was like a father figure to her. 25 years into her illness, she found that there was a, discovered a, a channeler in Australia who was in communication with the race of beings, so-called Zetas, that were also staging these abduction experiences with her. She went to this uh, channeler and said, if you're for real, ask the ETs to heal me. A short time later, she had a typical abduction experience. She found herself lying down beneath a kind of large television set, which showed the shape of a woman's body. And in the various parts of her body, there was pink, for her spleen and green for her lymph nodes. And she was led to believe that this was showing the disease activity throughout her body. She then experienced tremendous electrical shock going through her body, like every muscle in her body was being electrocuted and she was shaking violently. She looked off to the side and there were four extraterrestrials, the grays that she was familiar with, and they were covered in halos. She then woke up, uh, it was morning, and to her surprise, she did not have the typical fatigue that she was used to. On awakening, she felt like usually she hadn't slept at all. She realized that she had been cured. Within a week, she was lifting weights and she was hiking several miles a day. During a subsequent healing, she asked the one extraterrestrial being that was like a father figure to her, she says, why? Why didn't you heal me before? The answer that she got was so much shocking. They, they said, the being said, you never asked us to heal you. Well, why did you heal me then? And the extraterrestrial being allegedly said, because we take care of our own. So the extraterrestrials will extend the healing modality to beings that have provided a service to them, or of importance for one reason or another. And that's the explanation that I offer. They don't, they do not offer the service to humanity, but it's part of the project that uh, drives them to be in our world and, and interact with us on an ongoing basis. As far as you know, do extraterrestrials even want to help humanity get to that that next level that next level of consciousness that next level of faith uh i'm a contact experiencer i'm a contactee so my contacts have been favorable 
Uh, I'm a, a, of the opinion, as a former anti-nuclear weapons activist, that UFO appearing across the planet at nuclear bases and interfering with the weapon systems is sending humanity the same kind of message that our doctors' movement and our international peace movement have sent for, for since the dawn of the nuclear era. These weapons are not real weapons. They're instruments of genocide. We must get rid of them. Lieutenant Salas, who was uh, at the missile silo when the ETs in 1967 turned off their weapons, he's of the same opinion. I believe their operation here is a helping one. I could be wrong, but the only way we're going to know is to continue to engage them with every method that we have, physically, telepathically, spiritually. And if they are here to do us ill, we will still need to communicate with them. We're going to have to acknowledge their presence and deal with it. So the message that I have is that they are here to assist us, but they're not here to save us. That's the work of us. They may inspire us to save ourselves by giving us messages about unsafe technology or as the children um, in Rhodesia, uh, Zimbabwe, the aerial school, giving them warnings about unsafe technology that's polluting the atmosphere. They will perhaps inspire us to save ourselves. But I'm of the opinion that if we need them to save us from ourselves, then we're not worth saving. If we are so insensitive to the needs of our children and generations unborn that we will damage the ecosphere to the point where our civilization is stressed to the breaking point, then we probably shouldn't be saved. We have to do it ourselves. We're going to have to organize our society on a more cooperative basis. And I think what the extraterrestrials are doing perhaps is showing us what the future of mankind is in terms of developing psychic ability where telepathic communication is not a rarity, but it is the common. We have that capacity, uh, but we have to develop it. That's that's my my opinion. They're here to help us, but not save us. Okay. How do we advance as a species then if we're not wanting the help or they're not willing to offer up the help? we got to earn that help. Well, one way is to stop damaging the biosphere by pouring fossil fuels, carbon, carbon dioxide produced into the atmosphere. Another way is to try to negotiate an end of the nuclear arms race. If we can control our destructive ways, whether it be polluting the environment or building weapons of genocide, that would be one very concrete step towards saying to them, we've evolved. If we could end racism and sexism and environmental pollution, then we have a chance with or without their help. You know, at one time, routine ritual sacrifice was the norm. At the, in the Americas and the Aztec civilizations, when defeated armies were captured by the Aztec warriors, they would tear out the beating heart of thousands of fallen warriors in sacrifices for the sun. At one time, chattel slavery, people being sold and held in chains, was the norm on our planet. If humanity can end ritual human sacrifice, if we can end chattel slavery, then perhaps we can end war and pollution. So you can look at history in, in the optimistic point of view and saying if, if progress can occur in these other areas, we're capable of perhaps proving that we can join some, I don't necessarily believe there's a confederation of planets like in Star Trek, but some kind of open and cooperative relationship with the intelligences responsible for the phenomena. But if we continue on our own course, the one we're on now, uh, things are not going to work out. 
Okay. And without without sounding too disingenuous here, that that sounds like a very personal uh, study and, and what you would like to see in, that you've been an activist for for the last forty plus years. How do we know that's coming from extraterrestrials? Well, we know that the contact experiences are bringing back the messages. I mean, I didn't invent that. That's part of the history of contact for the last seventy years. The, they're, they're, these communications have been occurring. And we know, as a matter of fact, if you if you doubt it, just open up a book called UFOs and Nukes by Robert Hastings or see his excellent video. These encounters on nuclear bases have been documented for since the dawn of the nuclear era. So, so there is an interest, there is a concern. Um, in terms of the relationship we now have with them, it's uh, we're very passive. And what I found exciting 30 years ago about the human initiated contact effort, and what I still find exciting is that we have an opportunity not to be passive, but to try to engage the phenomena, to learn about who they are, and in the process, learn about what we are capable of. I had to overcome a lot of fear uh, in terms of doing the contact work. Um, some teams are more successful than others. We can talk about why Mission Rama has been so successful in terms of having people coming back from their encounters with memories of onboard experiences, truly remarkable events, going through dimensional portals, which are multiply witnessed. These are important developments that people need to hear about. And perhaps on a future show, I can talk about the astounding work of Rama. One of my co-workers on my team, Captain Joe Vallejo, was invited in, in August of 1994 to go to the Rama Research Station, not far from Mount Shasta, where in groups of seven people from the Rama network entered into a dimensional portal. And Captain Joe Vallejo described what it was like to be in this he said that a light appeared in the field. It then formed a purple light and formed a doorway. And as people were chanting Om, the Zendra or dimensional portal materialized. And in groups of seven, they went into the portal. Joe was in the last group. And the people had been chanting for over an hour. He said that inside the portal, it was felt very claustrophobic. The walls, although they were not dis distinct, they were present and they were made of the same purple light that had formed the entrance. As the people outside chanting Om became fatigued, the, the Zendra started to collapse. The walls became even more indistinct. And he said that when he, when he was chanting inside the Zendra, it sounded like they were underwater. The sound waves transmitted differently uh, in that tight space. And things were moving very slowly as if there was a distortion of time space in the Zendra. As the portal was collapsing, the people inside became alarmed and they started chanting Om with more vigor. And as they were louder and louder, the Zendra, which had been collapsing, reformed and became more visible, and they were able to exit the Sandra. This is an example of cooperation where multiple witnesses are allowed to experience what is purported to be dimensional te technology. So those kinds of encounters give me hope that we can further our relationship with the intelligence and learn more, not only about ourselves in terms of what we're willing to do to reach out to them, but also in terms of their technology. I'm a firm believer in these Zendras and who is chosen. I, I would love to attend one. And they seem to work very well at places like Mount Shasta. You know, the, the idea that you can summon these extraterrestrials through these meditation sessions and they appear through mist or clouds or, or vortexes, whatever you want to call them, are pretty phenomenal. What's it like participating in one of these? 
Well, I, I had my own Sanjay experience. They tell us not to uh, have any expectations. Um, I, of course, after hearing about my friend Joe Vallejo's Sandra, all I could think about when I was at that uh, Rama site was where was the purple light going to appear in the field and where was the doorway going to open up? That's not what happened. What did happen was there was a change in the density of the air around me. Um, I did not see a portal, but the stream that had been bubbling um, 20 yards away from us, which was barely audible, suddenly became very, very loud as if the sound waves were being transmitted uh, in a, a more efficient way. There was a change in the environment and I found myself being pulled forward and I, I had to catch myself from falling. So that was my personal Sendra experience. Um, but people from Rama of sound, mind and body have described going into these portals and being transported to what they believed were a moon of Jupiter called Ganymede. And these uh, visitations were a, a part of the Rama story that go back to 1974, when Sixto Wells, through automatic writing, made contact with what he was led to believe was a race of spiritually enlightened extraterrestrial beings. So Rama has operated all over the world. I met with a Rama activist. I don't know how much time we have. You got about three minutes, three minutes. Yeah. Um, I met a, a Rama activist who was offered to a board spacecraft. He was uh, part of a team at, operating on Mount Shasta. And the, he was told telepathically that only he and one other person, a, a young woman, would be allowed to enter the ET craft. When the young people who were part of the group left, they stayed on site and the saucer that they had seen previously returned. But there was a proviso. And that was, there was no guarantee that if they went on board craft, they would be returned. This has been the same advice that was given by Dr. Stephen Greer to our contact teams 30 years ago. The young woman had a 10 year old at home and she could not go on board without being reassured that they would be returned. And so the craft left. So this is another aspect of the human ET relationship. Now, my own opinion is that if someone like me were taken aboard, of course they would return me because I'd have an opportunity to share that experience on spaced out radio and uh, spread the word. But that is part of uh, the conditions of our work and we have to uh, deal with our fears. I believe it's a trust issue. And that's why they, they, if you don't trust them enough to return you and you wanna put conditions on your experience, you're probably not ready to go. Dr. Joseph Burks, we have about just over one minute here left with you tonight. And I wanna say thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio. It has been an honor and a pleasure to have you back on this show. And you're a man of brilliance and, con and conviction, that is for sure. And let everybody know in our audience where they can find your research and more about what you're working on. I can, you can find my research uh, with Preston Dennett and Beyond UFOs. I get on Amazon. There'll be a new book coming out where I talk about the virtual experience model, the role of illusion and contact. And that book is going to be published probably in January. It's, it's called A Greater Reality with Ray Hernandez as the editor. I'm on Medium. You can find my articles there out through the internet, Joe Burks on Medium, as well as Facebook on Contact Underground. It is always a pleasure to have you on. I apologize that uh, Dr. Bob McGuire could not be in attendance with us tonight due to a family emergency, but nonetheless, you were great. I know I'm not the scientist Dr. Uh, McGuire is, but I hope I did you some justice tonight with some good questions. And thank you once again, Dr. Joseph Burks, for coming on Spaced Out Radio. It is always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Coming up next, we have John Hudson here, the unbiased UFO report. 
We're going to see what John wants to get into. Where's them aliens, John? Where are them aliens? And, of course, we have the Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. Great job, Doc. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. I hope your voice feels better soon. Well, it'll feel better by tomorrow. I just uh, go to bed, rub some Vicks on the chest. Tell Bob next. that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of him and I'm going to pray for healing for his mom. Yes, not a problem. Not a problem. We'll pass that on to him. All right. Mm-hmm. Take care, boss. Okay. Good night. Good night. Dr. Joseph Burks, everyone. That's a good show. <clears throat> that is a good show. Honey and tea doesn't work for a radio voice. It's, uh, unfortunately, it's never worked for me. Uh, my go-to is Advil, cold, and sinus, and um, vitamins and a lot of uh, Vicks VapoRub. And then uh, if that doesn't work, I torque it up a little bit with uh, shooting some hot sauce, habanero, or hotter burn the shit out of my throat. That works really well. It really does. Hi, Lori Rosenfeld. How are you? Good to see you. Two spoonfuls of hot sauce. That's right, the Michael Leger. That's how I broke through bronchitis in 2019. You're not heading to Shasta for the weekend, Chad Smith. You don't fly. You know, if Mount Shasta ever blew up and the volcano erupted, all they'd have to do is take a couple of Chinook helicopters, lift Fapster up on his side, drop it half his head down the hole. It'll plug it right up. Boom. No more volcano. Just like that. No more eruption. Hold on. What is John saying here? All right, buddy. Uh, Stu, force a habit so I don't go outside. Truth, B. Hoff. Truth. Oh, oregano oil is horrible, horrible stuff. I did that one time. I didn't get the taste out of my mouth for like five hours. It's disgusting. Never again. All right. there's a, There he is, everyone. Fedora John. I've been told I have to stop calling you Stetson John and start calling you Fedora John. <laughs> You know, Dave, I, I was never going to make a comment about it. I was just being polite. I enjoyed the nickname. So, you know, but yeah, it was, it was good, good of Bob to uh, bring that up. But yeah, yeah I totally yes. understand. Damn Bob McGuire. <laughs> so he's so right. <laughs> All 
Yeah. So I, I I missed what you said. What'd you do to your voice? Oh, I took a nap earlier and over the last year, year and a half, I become uh <clears throat> I I don't know if I'm allergic or uh uh or what, but the pet dander in my house and my dogs always jump up on my bed. Howard, how are you? Far flung, Excaliperful. Good to see you guys. Anyways, long story short, I'm taking a nap in bed after work, and I just started coughing. And I, I cough for about 20 minutes straight, and it just killed my chest and everything. So that's it. Hold on, guys. Here we go. Five seconds. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's time once again for the unbiased UFO report. The man known as Fedora John, John Hudson, is here to hang on out and tell us the latest news. And John, we're going to start off with the two of the Stars Academy making a little bit of Headline news again, that's Tom DeLong's group, after a report from the Black Vault's John Greenwald. Fill us in. Well, first off, um, thanks for everyone uh, sticking around. It's, it's great to see you all. Um, and once again, hats off to uh, to John Greenwald for his, his great work. And uh, the rather amusing part of this, at least in my opinion, is that the uh, TTSA's um, part in this is actually the absence of news rather than it is their contribute their, their contribution to news um essentially you know a lot of you know the story of the of the army uh, uh crater and uh essentially this is a, a joint in, um, agreement between ttsa and the army to use ttsa labs to investigate parts that that uh, ttsa had collected ttsa has been completely quiet on this front um they they will mention a little bit in their uh, in their um, investor relation, that's about it. Uh, Mr. Greenwald uh, was able to get through a um, Freedom of Information Act um, information as well as through just talking to the Army, who evidently was quite willing to share information, uh, unlike uh, some others. And the Army was very politely and said, no, actually, we've completed much of that testing, um, you know, at least initial testing. It, the project goes on. And uh, and he even found a um, a, a report from through an FOIA that basically said that not only was it moving forward, but they had a schedule, and the, the DoD had uh, DDPR our office had requested that they take over, um, you know, communication for it. Now the quick funny side note is is that now the DoD claims that they didn't ever make that request, but what we have here is we have the Army being forthcoming, and we have TT, TTSA saying. No comment. But that is so typical of Tom DeLong and his group. I mean, this is where I have issues with the two, the stars Academy when they held the press list press conference back in on October 10th of 2017, they were talking about everything being transparent, everything going in front of the public, everything's going to be upfront. And it's been secret after secret after secret after secret. Why should we even pay attention to Tom DeLong's To The Stars Academy anymore? Yeah, it's it's super challenging. And you know the, the problem that I have is that I come from 
the startup world. I've been involved in six startups. I might be joining my seventh. And I understand that usually your first three years, three years or so, you're usually in what's called stealth mode. You don't say anything because honestly, you don't really know if you're going to make it or not. And so, and your plans might change. Unfortunately, TTSA didn't follow this rule and they tried to come out and make press in the beginning. But realistically, a lot of times there isn't much they can say because of where they are. And so I understand part of it. But the problem is, is that they're, they're very schizophrenic about it as far as when they do release information and when they don't. And when you have a situation where the army is being more forthcoming than you are about something, then you're you're probably treading into some pretty dangerous territory. Tom DeLong hasn't done anything, anything since Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and Steve Justice left the To the Stars Academy. He hasn't made a he made a, a re really strange formal announcement about their resignations recently. He was on a podcast with Jim Semivan and and himself. You know. Uh, which they really said nothing once again. I think the UFO community and the public at large, especially those who are investors, have lost a lot of faith in the TTSA. And should they even be in the news anymore? Or is this project done and hanging on by just, you know, an oxygen tank here? Well, I, I think that they've, look, most places reach this point, and TTSA did a long time ago. You get to a point where you only talk about what you're doing. You only talk about what you can show. You've lost trust and you can no longer talk about what you haven't done yet. And they reached that point a while ago. And so as far as I'm concerned, if Tom wants to talk about the movies he's working on, if he wants to talk about books that are coming out, if he wants to talk about any of the media aspect of what he's doing, which let's face it, is all he has to focus on now. And what he's probably good at, much less the other stuff. If he wants to talk about that, I'm all for it. But um, I, I would argue that the rest of it, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's probably best to just focus on what you can really do. No, and I understand that. But it's always been a, what if I told you? Would you believe it if I told you? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have no faith in the man. I think his story is BS from how the TTSA got started. I think it's BS that they cried for transparency about UFOs, and then they did the exact opposite, screwing the public, screwing their investors. All right? I, yeah, I think I mean, it's, I, 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 oh, go ahead. I'm not a fan of the organization. I really am not. Yeah, now, I, that being said, I'm a big fan of Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon and their work, but for Tom DeLonge and his organization, not there. Not there. I think it's well, a complete and, failure. I will, I will just differ with you in this one aspect, and that is that, that I was involved in TTSA very early, and, and, I, and I, I will admit I'm one of the people that bought a very, very small number of shares. And the entire game plan was to raise $50 million out of the IPO, off, out of the stock offering, right? If they had raised that money, I think things would have played out incredibly differently. I think as soon as they only raised $2 million, they were now in a really bad spot they then tried to raise money from the government that failed as well. As soon as that failed, they were in deep trouble. And that, and when a startup gets into that position, they make compromises, they change strategy, they make deals with people they wouldn't normally make with. And honestly, I've seen this happen in, in a lot of places before that had nothing to do with UFOs. And so I agree with you. The state we're in now is not nice, yeah, but, but that... I think that the way we got here is perhaps a little more organic. You know what? We're going to have to debate this on one of our after party shows because I think a lot of it we're on the same page. We're just coming at it from different angles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the, the TTSA is a joke. I've, I've never been uh, supported, supportive of it. I've never asked my listeners to support it. Could never get behind it. Too many lies, too much deceit. And when you come out in your first press conference and say you are going to be the public watchdog to UFOs because these things are happening, and then the first thing you start doing is playing games like they did in that opening press conference with no media there, it is a complete joke. And I don't think that any respect has to do with that. Learning what I know from what was happening behind the scenes as to why there was no media coverage or anything along those lines, it really makes sense 
that this is a complete failure, you know, complete failure. I would and agree that, there. And that's totally what it is. There. That's what it is. All right, let's move on to topic number two because we're going to go to Stanford University where there's some very, very top-notch scientists that the public will know the names of looking into some debris. Yeah. So this is this is a this is a really interesting um, change. Uh, uh, I should say event that's occurred because essentially um, what is happening is not all that different from what we learned in James Fox's movie. Okay, this is talking about the um, the equipment that they now have at Stanford, which is um, essentially a multi-parameter ion beam imager. Okay, this is a multi-million dollar piece of equipment that is quite unique to Stanford. And this allows them to look at things at the subatomic level, okay, which is not something we've been able to do or at least do in most places uh, up till recently. And so basically this allows Dr. Gary Nolan, uh, who works at Stanford, as far as and, and Jacques Vallée, who, who has a relationship with Stanford, to essentially take the bits that, that Vallée has been collecting and analyze them underneath this this new uh this new microscope but what's interesting is for some reason and i don't know what happened but for some reason this suddenly tripped up just in the last couple of days and uh no less than at least three different places are all reporting this at this as it went from science news to the mirror in the uk to a, you know a, a, a more nerdy site called giant freaking robot i mean basically suddenly this story is catching fire all over the place and i understand why it's catching fire to me it's a very interesting story because what they're talking about is being able to modify isotopes being able to actually change the number of neutrons that you have so that you actually end up with a different isotope of a, um, you know, of, of a fundamental, you know, aspect of, of, of you know, the t we do atomic, but this is subatomic. This is a very different scale of, of engineering. And if they can prove that, that's a big deal. So I get the excitement. I don't understand why it's popped up now. The amount of knowledge that both Jacques Vallée and Gary Nolan have in this field where most of their own studying and work at Stanford is revolving around the study of UFOs and, and the technology behind them. Do you believe that they are getting any closer to trying to find at least some, some minor answers to what this metamaterials are? Uh, so, Okay, so what, what I'm about to say is based on a small amount of information. Okay, I'll, I'll admit that up front. But it's my personal opinion at this point that they are much further along than they're admitting. And that what's really going on is that they're having to pick and choose what papers they put out first. Because going through peer review, um, you know, what's involved. I mean, basically what, what, uh, what Nolan explained to us at one point was it was about $500,000 per uh, category of experiment. And so my understanding is in the beginning, Nolan was looking at experiencers, specifically looking at that 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 antenna concept in the brain, and that the the analysis of parts would come a little bit later. Ever since James Fox's film came out, we've seen that they're paying more attention to it. But my experience with Dr. Gary Nolan uh, and Jacques Vallée is that they do a lot of work before they talk. And so my guess is is that they've already seen that because basically what what Gary Nolan's quote uh, came down to was that he said, we build our world with 80 elements. Someone else is building the world with 253 different isotopes. That was a direct quote from Gary Nolan. And that shows that he actually knows what he's looking at now. And he's seen what he's seen. And now it's just a matter of, of getting it formally written up and going through peer review. I like Drew's comment here. Normally, we don't bring audience comments into this. But he says, scientists deep inside the program program in quotation marks, know exactly what the metamaterials are. They have had 75 years to study it. Do you think that comes into play? Um, to a degree, but here's the thing. You can you can look at something and you can think, look, this, this is clearly carbon, but it's behaving differently. So therefore, I can infer from that that it's perhaps a different isotope of carbon. But if I can't actually look at it at that level and verify that, you know, maybe I can verify it through other in, in, inferred means, but the, my point is, is that this ability to actually see it with a with an actual scope, that is, you know, that is at least new to the to the to the white world, and I think that I think that you have there's likely some progress, 
But I think ultimately, like what you saw in um, in Ross Colhart's book, um, they're still they they might be able to see the samples. They might be able to have some gleaning of what they do and how they and how they were built. But as far as being able to replicate that, I I I don't know. I, I'm I'm really I'm really in the unknown zone right now as far as whether they can actually replicate it. All right. Do we know where this bin of material came from? Yes. Yeah, so this specific um, this specific case that they're talking about in most of these articles is a, a sample that came from Africa. But um, if you go, if you if you look at the um, and there's pictures online as well. If you look at um, Jacques' uh, uh, stack of of components, he has like a stack of like three different small colored canisters, and each one of those canisters has a different sample in it. This is basically Jacques' personal collection. This is what he's been carrying around with him for years, adding to it everywhere he goes. So, so it's and it's and it's completely separate than what TTSA had or what the army's testing. This is Jacques Vallée's, you know, personal stash. And so, um, but I, my understanding is that the 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 parts that they're specifically talking about in most of these articles is is the is some parts that were recovered in Africa. Hmm. Well, that. Uh... That really hits the nail on the head, my friend. Really hits the nail on the head for what they are working on. I hope they are able to come up with some sort of solution. How does this, uh, this will be my final question for you, as someone who do, really doesn't understand the, the scientific side of how this works, what are they trying to study with these materials? Is it about what are those materials made of, John, or where they came from? It, it's you. It's very, very hard to to nothing comes with a made in here label right so what you're doing is you're you're looking at how it's constructed and if we can see that look someone built this by changing the number of neutrons of creating new isotopes of things and sticking those together to get a different behavior and those are isotopes thing that we can't are not natural in on earth we don't know how to build you can essentially infer with a tremendous amount of, of evidence that these materials were not built on this planet. And if they can show that in a, in a clear way in a paper and get that paper peer reviewed, what you will have is you will have a paper showing that there is someone manufacturing something intelligently and on purpose with specific needs and purposes that are not from Earth. Hmm. Well, we're going to have to leave it. We're, we're going to have to leave it right there, my friend John Hudson. Another great unbiased UFO report. We'll talk to you in a couple nights' time. We really do appreciate you coming on in and keeping us very much up to date. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Well, let's get to the news. Shirky Poo's got us all ready and roaring for tonight. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the Florida woman. Yes, this was not par for the course at all. Not at all. A big, 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 big bogey here. A naked woman allegedly drove a golf cart through the scene of a tense, hours-long standoff between cops and an armed suspect in Florida. Officers were trying to defuse the standoff with an armed teenager this past weekend when 28-year-old Jessica Smith allegedly decided to drive through the middle of the crime scene in Dunedin, west of Tampa, just after midnight. Smith, who had nothing to do with the standoff at all, was in her birthday suit, reeked of alcohol, of course she did, when she just strolled on through the law enforcement perimeter, according to an arrest affidavit. The woman, who lives in Boston, allegedly drove past multiple marked law enforcement vehicles in the direction of the armed suspect, who was perched on the roof of a home. After she refused to leave the area, sheriff's deputies eventually pulled her from the golf cart and handcuffed her as they stand off with the armed team continued to unfold. Smith had a distinct odor of an alcoholic beverage coming from her, and she was completely rude, the affidavit said. Her actions and inability to follow directions put multiple deputies at risk for potentially getting shot at. 
Yep. Smith was charged with resisting an officer without violence. She had no comment when reached by the media. The standoff that Smith allegedly interrupted went on for another six hours and involved 18-year-old Miles Abbott. Abbott was allegedly fired a gun at people before climbing onto the roof of a house and pointing his gun at responding officers. He has been arrested. Oh, yes. Naked golf cart driving. That's our world right now. A baseball-sized clump of hair that came from the head of Elvis Presley has sold at auction for $72,500. Elvis Presley jar of hair with extensive documentation sold for the big ticket money at Cruise GWS Auctions based in L.A. that also included the sale of the performer's iconic jumpsuit from his 1972 Madison Square Garden performance for $1,012,500. The auction house said the baseball-sized clump of hair was collected over a course of multiple haircuts by Homer Gilliland, Presley's personal barber, for more than two decades. The hair was kept in a plastic bag by Gilliland, who gifted it to Thomas Morgan, a close friend of both the barber and the singer. The extensive documentation included with the hair, which has since been transferred to a sealed jar, includes plane tickets from the original occasion when Presley brought Gilliland on the road with him to cut his hair and a certificate of authenticity signed by John Resnikoff of University Archives, the world's most trusted authority in the field of hair collecting. Look at that. Elvis's hair is worth 72 grand. Makes me wonder what mine might be worth one day. <laughs> Thought of the Dave happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Today's Thought of the Dave is as follows. Let's see what we got for you. How can we trust ET experiencers' stories? Chuck, honestly, compare their stories to others. Always listen and don't judge. Michael, most experiencers do not make up stories about what they've experienced. Most people are believable. Joshua, we can't really without hard evidence, but we can listen and be open-minded, and most importantly, keep it open to heart. Tyler, ask them to tell the story backwards. When someone is lying, it usually will. it's usually well thought out and in a certain order. So start at the end and give them the reverse trip, and the BS story will come out every time. Lee, that's a good question. I have to listen to my inner voice. Jeannie, I just believe them. Why would they lie? Not much to gain if they did. Lon, I suppose it comes down to credibility and trust. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Dame. Thank you to Captain Shirk for the Newswire and John Hudson for the unbiased UFO report, along with Dr. Joseph Burks on Science Bob and Friends. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, LGAB, Twitch, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. You know, honestly, I look forward to uh, SuperQuest 
Roy there every night. Take us home, baby. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah, buddy. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Give me one sec here. Start downloading that. Close that up. No, that's not what I wanted. Son of a gun. <laughs> Super Quest does it again. warm in here. Thank you, Behoff. It, it is full of volume right now. <clears throat> Hi, Looney. I skipped to my Lou. Fat bass. I am growing my hair back. I wasn't going to. I was going to keep it down to about here. About right there. But I have my personal reasons as to why I'm going to grow it back. And no, I'm not donating it this time. No, I can't. You know what? I'm not growing my beard. I, I might a little bit come winter when it starts to get cold, but I'm not going to really grow my beard much anymore. We have some hearing impaired listeners who have troubles reading my lips when my beard is quite full. So that is the reason why I'm going to uh, not grow my beard as heavy as I had it before. That's all we do is Bigfoot and aliens, Looney. God, every now and again, I'd like to talk about something else, man. All we do. Oob to Joe's mane. You've got aliens. Yes, you do. You dirty bastard with the beautiful hair. Oob. We're not shaving my head, Fap. And you should never shave your head either, Fap. It's so big, people will think you got bread rolls on the back of your neck. Viewers can on YouTube, River Dogma. Uh, no, uh, this one is... <clears throat> it's dirty because my son had his fingerprints all over it. This is a J. Terser. It's on its last legs. But I love it. I love it. It's got a nice heavy weight to it. And then this one here uh, is an ARC. This is out of Italy or something like that. That's a gorgeous guitar. 
It really is. It's got a nice headstock on it, too. Oh, goodness, my gnome was moving. So, I like this one. It feels good in the hands, too. Come on. Can you name it? That's all I got. I gotta get to work here. Polar Eclipse, how are you? Philip Baca, Dr. Zed Smith, how are you? What the hell am I doing? That's where I am. Hey, tomorrow, tomorrow night on the show, Bryce Zabel joins us. We're going to talk UFOs tomorrow night, just for Looney. Jason, thank you so much for that awesome super chat, man. 
Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you earlier to Anne Celine for doing the super chat. Really appreciate that. Fabster, Eva just said she needs a date. There it is. We have it right there, Fap. Doug Stevenson, lay down. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear gorgeous Katie. Happy birthday to you. There you go. He didn't even like my singing of happy birthday to her. That hurts. <clears throat> that hurts. Mm -hmm. Thought I had something special going on there. Apparently not. She's like, shut the hell up, Dave Scott, you jerk and a half. Ouch. Katie, if you saw Joe Joe's hair, you would want to brush his hair too. I do. I'm not gonna lie. I would brush Joe's hair. I would love to, Looney. Hard to find. Hard to find. Hey, remember that time I sang happy birthday to Katie and she told me to shut the hell up? I was like offended that I did. Remember that?
Nobody asked your age. For all we know, you're like 25. Just saying. But who am I? Who am I? No, we're not banning Katie. It's her birthday. We can't ban her on her birthday. If I could repeat life, it would be between the age of like 34 and 40 again. Or 42. That was the funnest times. Charge.
see if I can find it for John. Sorry, I'm looking for something for John. <clears throat> yeah, my nose whistle. Don't remind me. I will never own an ugly reverse headstock guitar. Oh, uh, what color is your BC Rich Bitch? Oh, God, those are gorgeous. Oh, I love those guitars. Is it is that a 10 string? Oh, man, that's still a gorgeous guitar. I am practicing. I wouldn't call myself anywhere near close to being good yet, though.
<laughs> Very strong comment, Fabster. No, I will learn how to play guitar. Am I eating popcorn? No. Popcorn's terrible to eat while on the radio. Oob, got your guitar picture. No, I don't like popcorn in my teeth. It always gets caught in my teeth. Not doing popcorn. Uh, I will get Ross on uh, again.
No, I, dude, I'm way too tired right now, Grandmaster. I'm sorry. I'm not feeling good this evening. So I apologize. That's my fault. All right, tomorrow night on the show, uh, Bryce Zabel will join us. We're going to be talking UFOs and the story behind it. What's really going on? What's really in the news? What can we trust? What can't we trust? Everything along those lines is going to be a great show tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. Thank you to Jason, Chad, Times 2, and Jeremy, Backspin, Alicia, Fabster, Patrick, Double Tim, Tessa and Nicola for the amazing super chats tonight. Yes, the Seattle Kraken. Thank you to all the vets who are uh, listening to this show. Really appreciate you. And I'm tired, guys. I'm going to go to bed. And you're going to get a great show tomorrow night. So we'll see you all then, okay? Take care.